Chapter Seven of The Life of Cicero, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The Life of Cicero, Volume Two, by Anthony Trollope. Chapter Seven. Marcellus, Ligarius, and Deotarus. Side note: B.C. Forty-eight, Aetat Sixty-One. The battle of Thapsus in Africa took place in the spring of this year, and Cato destroyed himself with true stoical tranquillity, determined not to live under Caesar's rule. If we may believe the story which, probably, Hirtius has given us in his account of the civil war in Africa, and which has come down to us together with Caesar's commentaries, Cato left his last instructions to some of his officers, and then took his sword into his bed with him, and stabbed himself. Cicero, who in his dream of Scipio has given his readers such excellent advice in regard to suicide, has understood that Cato must be allowed the praise of acting up to his own principles. He would rather die than behold the face of the tyrant who had enslaved him. To Cato it was nothing that he should leave to others the burden of living under Caesar, but to himself the idea of a superior caused an unendurable affront. The Catonis nobile letum has reconciled itself to the poets of all ages. Men, indeed, have refused to see that he fled from a danger which he felt to be too much for him, and that in doing so he had lacked something of the courage of a man. Many other Romans of the time did the same thing, but to none has been given all the honour which has been allowed to Cato. Cicero felt as others have done, and allowed all his little jealousies to die away. It was but a short time before that Cato had voted against the decree of the Senate giving Cicero his supplication. Cicero had then been much annoyed, but now Cato had died fighting for the Republic, and was to be forgiven all personal offences. Cicero wrote an eulogy of Cato, which was known by the name of Cato, and it was much discussed at Rome at the time. It has now been lost. He sent it to Caesar, having been bold enough to say in it whatever occurred to him should be said in Cato's praise. We may imagine that had it not pleased him to be generous, had he not been governed by that feeling of de mortuis nil nisi bonum, which is now common to us all, he might have said much that was not good. Cato had endeavoured to live up to the austerest rules of the Stoics, a mode of living altogether antagonistic to Cicero's views. But we know that he praised Cato to the full and we know also that Caesar nobly took the praise in good part, as coming from Cicero, and answered it in an anti-Cato, in which he stated his reasons for differing from Cicero. We can understand how Caesar should have shown that the rigid Stoic was not a man likely to be of service to his country. There came up at this period a question which made itself popular among the optimates of Rome as to the return of Marcellus, the man of Como, whom Marcellus had flogged, will be remembered, the Roman citizen who had first been made a citizen by Caesar. This is mentioned now not as the cause of Caesar's enmity, who did not care much probably for his citizen, but as showing the spirit of the man. He, Marcellus, had been consul four years since, B.C. 51, and had then endeavoured to procure Caesar's recall from his province. He was one of the optimates, an oligarch altogether opposed to Caesar, a Roman nobleman of fairly good repute, who had never bent to Caesar, but had believed thoroughly in his order, and had thought, till the day of Pharsalia came, that the consuls and the senate would rule for ever. The day of Pharsalia did come, and Marcellus went into voluntary banishment in Mytilene. After Pharsalia Caesar's clemency began to make itself known. There was a pardon for almost every Roman who had fought against him and would accept it. No spark of anger burned in Caesar's bosom, except against one or two, of whom Marcellus was one. He was too wise to be angry with men whose services he might require. It was Caesar's wish not to drive out the good men, but to induce them to remain in Rome, living by the grace of his favour. Marcellus had many friends, and it seems that a public effort was made to obtain for him permission to come back to Rome. We must imagine that Caesar had hitherto refused, probably with the idea of making his final concession the more valuable. At last the united senators, determined to implore his grace, 
and the consulars rose one after another in their places, and all, with one exception, asked that Marcellus might be allowed to return. Cicero, however, had remained silent to the last. There must have been, I think, some plot to get Cicero onto his legs. He had gone to meet Caesar at Bundisium when he came back from the east, had returned to Rome under his auspices, and had lived in pleasant friendship with Caesar's friends. Pardon seems to have been accorded to Cicero without an effort. As far as he was concerned, that hostile journey to Dyrrachium, for he did not travel farther towards the camp, counted for nothing with Caesar. He was allowed to live in peace, at Rome, or at his villas, as he might please, so long as Caesar might rule. The idea seems to have been that he should gradually become absorbed among Caesar's followers. But hitherto he had remained silent. It was now six years since his voice had been heard in Rome. He had spoken for Milo, or had intended to speak, and in the same affair for Munatius Plancus and for Saufeus, B.C. 52. He had then been in his fifty-fifth year, and it might well be that six years of silence at such a period of his life would not be broken. It was manifestly his intention not to speak again, at any rate in the Senate, though the threats made by him as to his total retirement should not be taken as meaning much. Such threats from statesmen depend generally on the wishes of other men. But he held his place in the Senate, and occasionally attended the debates. When this affair of Marcellus came on, and all the senators of consular rank, excepting only Volcatius and Cicero, had risen and had implored Caesar in a few words to condescend to be generous, when Claudius Marcellus had knelt at Caesar's feet to ask for his brother's liberty, and Caesar himself, after reminding them of the bitterness of the man, had still declared that he could not refuse the powers of the Senate, then Cicero, as though driven by the magnanimity of the conqueror, rose from his place, and poured forth his thanks in the speech which is still extant. That used to be the story, till there came the German critic Wolf, who, at the beginning of this century, told us that Cicero did not utter the words attributed to him, and could not have uttered them. According to Wolf, it would be doing Cicero an egregious wrong to suppose him capable of having used such words, which are not Latin, and which were probably written by some ignoramus in the time of Tiberius. Such a verdict might have been taken as fatal, for Wolf's scholarship and powers of criticism are acknowledged, in spite of La Harpe, the French scholar and critic, who has named the Marcellus as a thing of excellence, comparing it with the eulogistic speeches of Isocrates. The praise of La Harpe was previous to the condemnation of Wolf, and we might have been willing to accede to the German as being the later and probably the more accurate. Mr. Long, the British editor of the Orations, Mr. Long, who has so loudly condemned the four speeches supposed to have been made after Cicero's return from exile, gives us no certain guidance. Mr. Long, at any rate, has not been so disgusted by the Tiberian Latin as to feel himself bound to repudiate it. If he can read the Pro Marcello, so can I, and so, my reader, might you do probably without detriment. But these differences among the great philologic critics tend to make us, who are so infinitely less learned, better contented with our own lot. I, who had read the Pro Marcello without stumbling over its halting Latinity, should have felt myself crushed when I afterwards came across Wolf's denunciations, had I not been somewhat comforted by La Harpe. But when I found that Mr. Long, in his introduction to the piece, though he discusses Wolf's doctrine, still gives to the orator the advantage, as it may be, of his imprimatur, I felt that I might go on, and not be ashamed of myself. This is the story that has now to be told of the speech pro Marcello. At the time the matter ended very tragically. As soon as Caesar had yielded, Cicero wrote to Marcellus, giving him strong reasons for coming home. Marcellus answered him, saying that it was impossible. He thanks Cicero shortly, but with kindly dignity he declines. With the comforts of the city I can well dispense, he says. Then Cicero urges him again and again, using excellent arguments for his return, which at length prevail. In the spring of the next year Marcellus, on his way back to Rome, is at Athens. There Servius Sulpicius spends a day with him. 
But just as Sulpicius is about to pass on, there comes a slave to him, who tells him that Marcellus has been murdered. His friend Magius Kilo had stabbed him overnight, and had then destroyed himself. It was said that Kilo had asked Marcellus to pay his debts for him, and that Marcellus had refused. It seems to be more probable that Kilo had his own reasons for not choosing that his friend should return to Rome. Looking back at my own notes on the speech, it would make with us but a ten minutes after dinner speech, I see that it is said that it is chiefly remarkable for the beauty of the language and the abjectness of the praise of Caesar. This was before I had heard of Wolf. As to the praise, I doubt whether it should be called abject, regard being had to the feelings of the moment in which it was delivered. Cicero had risen to thank Caesar, on whose breath the recall of Marcellus depended, for his unexpected courtesy. In England we should not have thanked Caesar as Cicero did. O oh, Caesar, there is no flood of eloquence, no power of the tongue or of the pen, no richness of words which may emblazon or even dimly tell the story of your great deeds. Such language is unusual with us, as it would also be unusual to abuse our Pisos and our Vatiniuses, as did Cicero. It was the Southerner and the Roman who spoke to Southerners and to Romans. But undoubtedly there was present to the mind of Cicero the idea of saying words which Caesar might receive with pleasure. He was dictator, emperor, lord of all things, king. Cicero should have remained away, as Marcellus had done, were he not prepared to speak after this fashion. He had long held aloof from speech. At length the time had come when he was, as it were, caught in a trap and compelled to be eloquent. Side-note, B.C. 46, Itat 61. The silence had been broken, and in the course of the autumn he spoke on behalf of Ligarius, beseeching the conqueror to be again merciful. This case was by no means similar to that of Marcellus, who was exiled by no direct forfeiture of his right to live in Italy, but who had expatriated himself. In this case Ligarius had been banished with others, but it seems that the punishment had been inflicted on him, not from the special ill-will of Caesar, but from the malice of certain enemies, who, together with Ligarius, had found themselves among Pompey's followers when Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Ligarius had at this time been left as acting governor in Africa. In the confusion of the times, an unfortunate Pompeian named Varus had arrived in Africa, and to him, as being superior in rank, Ligarius had given up the government. Varus had then gone, leaving Ligarius still acting, and one Tubero had come with his son, and had demanded the office. Ligarius had refused to give it up, and the two Tuberos had departed, leaving the province in anger, and had fought at the Pharsalus. After the battle they made their peace with Caesar, and in the scramble that ensued, Ligarius was banished. Now the case was brought into the courts, in which Caesar sat as judge. The younger Tubero accused Ligarius, and Cicero defended him. It seems that, having been enticed to open his mouth on behalf of Marcellus, he found himself launched again into public life. But how great was the difference from his old life! It is not to the Judices or Patres Conscripti, or to the Quirites, that he now addresses himself, determined by the strength of his eloquence to overcome the opposition of stubborn minds, but to Caesar, whom he has to vanquish simply by praise. Once again he does the same thing when pleading for Deotarus, the king of Galatia, and it is impossible to deny as we read the phrases that the orator sinks in our esteem. It is not so much that we judge him to be small as that he has ceased to be great. He begins his speech for Ligarius by saying, My kinsman Tubero has brought before you, O Caesar, a new crime, and one not heard of up to this day, that Ligarius has been in Africa. The commencement would have been happy enough if it had not been addressed to Caesar. For he was addressing a judge, not appointed by any form, but self-assumed, a judge by military conquest. 
we cannot imagine how Caesar found time to sit there, with his legions round him, still under arms, and Spain not wholly conquered. But he did do so, and allowed himself to be persuaded to the side of mercy. Ligarius came back to Rome, and was one of those who plunged their daggers into him. But I cannot think that he should have been hindered by this trial and by Caesar's mercy from taking such a step, if by nothing else. Brutus and Cassius also stabbed him. The question to be decided is whether, on public grounds, these men were justified in killing him, a question as to which I should be premature in expressing an opinion here. There are some beautiful passages in this oration. Who is there, I ask, he says, who alleges Ligarius to have been in fault because he was in Africa? He does so who himself was most anxious to be there, and now complains that he was refused admittance by Ligarius, he who was in arms against Caesar. What was your sword doing, Tubero, in that Pharsalian army? Whom did you seek to kill then? What was the meaning of your weapon? What was it that you desired so eagerly, with those eyes and hands, with that passion in your heart? I press him too much. The young man seems to be disturbed. I will speak of myself, then, for I also was in that army. This was in Caesar's presence, and no doubt told with Caesar. We were all together in the same cause, you and I, and Ligarius. Why should you and I be pardoned? and not Ligarius. The oration is for the most part simply eulogistic. At any rate it was successful, and became at Rome for the time extremely popular. He writes about it early in the following year to Atticus, who has urged him to put something into it before it was published, to mitigate the feeling against Tubero. Cicero says in his reply to Atticus that the copies have already been given to the public, and that, indeed, he is not anxious on Tubero's behalf. Early in this year he had divorced Terentia, and seems at once to have married Publilia. Publilia had been his ward, and is supposed to have had a fortune of her own. He explains his own motives very clearly in a letter to his friend Plancius. In these wretched times he would have formed no new engagement, unless his own affairs had been as sad for him as were those of the Republic. But when he found that they to whom his prosperity should have been of the greatest concern were plotting against him within his own walls, he was forced to strengthen himself against the perfidy of his old inmates by placing his trust in a new. It must have been very bad with him when he had recourse to such a step as this. Shortly after this letter just quoted had been written, he divorced Publilia also. We are told because Publilia had treated Tullia with disrespect. We have no details on the subject, but we can well understand the pride of the young woman who declined to hear the constant praise of her stepdaughter and thought herself to be quite as good as Tullia. At any rate, she was sent away quickly from her new home, having remained there only long enough to have made not the most creditable episode in Cicero's life. At this time Dolabella, who assumed the consulship upon Caesar's death, and Hirtius, who became consul during the next year, used to attend upon Cicero and take lessons in elocution. So at least the story has been told, from a letter written in this year to his friend Poetus, but I should imagine that the lessons were not much in earnest. Why do you talk to me of your tunny-fish, your pilot-fish, and your cheese and sardines? Hirtius and Dolabella preside over my banquets and I teach them in return to make speeches. From this we may learn that Caesar's friends were most anxious to be also Cicero's friends. It may be said that Dolabella was his son-in-law, but Dolabella was at this moment on the eve of being divorced. It was in spite of his marriage that Dolabella still clung to Cicero. All Caesar's friends in Rome did the same, so that I am disposed to think that for this year, just till Tullia's death, he was falling, not into a happy state, but to the passive contentment of those who submit themselves to be ruled over by a single master. He had struggled all his life, and now, finding that he must yield, he thought that he might as well do so gracefully. It was so much easier to listen to the state secrets of Balbus, and to hear from Oppius how the money was spent, and then to dine with Hirtius or Dolabella, 
than to sit ever scowling at home, as Cato would have done had Cato lived. But with his feelings about the Republic at heart, how sad it must have been! Cato was gone, and Pompey, and Bibulus, and Marcellus was either gone or just about to go. Old age was creeping on. It was better to write philosophy in friendship with Caesar's friends than to be banished again whither he could not write it at all. Much, no doubt, he did in preparation for all those treatises which the next eighteen months were to bring forth. Caesar, just at the end of the year, had been again called to Spain, B.C. 46, to quell the last throbbings of the Pompeians, and then to fight the final battle of Munda. It would seem odd to us that so little should have been said about such an event by Cicero, and that the little should depend on the education of his son, were it not that, if we look at our own private letters written to-day to our friends, we find the same omission of great things. To Cicero the doings of his son were of more immediate moment than the doings of Caesar. The boy had been anxious to enlist for the Spanish war. Quintus, his cousin, had gone, and young Marcus was anxious to flutter his feathers beneath the eyes of royalty. At his age it was nothing to him that he had been taken to Pharsalia and made to bear arms on the opposite side. Caesar had become Caesar since he had learned to form his opinion on politics, and on Caesar's side all things seemed to be bright and prosperous. The lad was anxious to get away from his new stepmother, and asked his father for the means to go with the army to Spain. It appears by Cicero's letter to Atticus on the subject that in discussing the matter with his son he did yield. These Roman fathers, in whose hands we are told were the very lives of their sons, seem to have been much like Christian fathers of modern days in their indulgences. The lad was now nineteen years old, and does not appear to have been very willing at the first parental attempt to give up his military appanages and that swagger of the young officer which is so dear to the would-be military mind. Cicero tells him that if he joined the army he would find his cousin treated with greater favour than himself. Young Quintus was older, and had been already able to do something to push himself with Caesar's friends. Said tamen permisi. Nevertheless, I told him he might go, said Cicero sadly. But he did not go. He was allured probably by the promise of a separate establishment at Athens, whither he was sent to study with Cratippus. We find another proof of Cicero's wealth in the costliness of his son's household at Athens, as premeditated by the father. He is to live as do the sons of other great noblemen. He even names the young nobleman with whom he is to live. Bibulus was of the Calpurnian gens, Achidinus of the Manlian, and Messala of the Valerian, and these are the men whom Cicero, the nous homo from Arpinum, selects as those who shall not live at a greater cost than his son. He will not, however, at Athens want a horse. Why not? Why should not a young man so furnished want a horse at Athens? There are plenty here at home for the road, says Cicero. So young Cicero is furnished, and sent forth to learn philosophy and Greek. But no one has assayed to tell us why he should not want the horse. Young Cicero, when at Athens, did not do well. He writes home in the coming year to Tyro two letters which have been preserved for us, and which seem to give us but a bad account at any rate of his sincerity. The errors of his youth, he says, have afflicted him grievously. Not only is his mind shocked, but his ears cannot bear to hear of his own iniquity. And now, he says, I will give you a double joy to compensate for all the anxiety I have occasioned you. Know that I live with Cratippus, my master, more like a son than a pupil. I spend all my days with him, and very often part of the night. But he seems to have had some wit. Tyro has been made a freedman, and has bought a farm for himself. Young Marcus, from whom Tyro has asked for some assistance which Marcus cannot give him, jokes with him as to his country life, telling him that he sees him saving the apple-pips at dessert. Of the subsequent facts of the life of young Marcus, we do not know much. He did not suffer in the prescriptions of Antony and Augustus, as did his father and uncle and his cousin, 
He did live to be chosen as consul with Augustus, and had the reputation of a great drinker. For this latter assertion we have only the authority of Pliny the Elder, who tells us an absurd story among the wonders of drinking which he adduces. Middleton says a word or two on behalf of the young Cicero, which are as well worthy of credit as anything else that has been told. One last glance at him, which we can credit, is given in that letter to Tyro, and that, we admit, seems to us to be hypocritical. End of chapter 7, part 1